I'm just curious as well, Eddie, I mean, it would be amiss of me not to ask about the, the current COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Do you think that is changing the landscape for education? Is it asking us to ask some questions that we never have before? Or are they, uh, where do you kind of see this panning out? Because it's mm. definitely not over. Mm. Um, yeah, no, uh, without a doubt. I mean, I think that COVID-19 has certainly taught us all many lessons. Um, you know, not least of which is, you know, how to make sure we share screen and hit the unmute button and all those kinds of things that we laugh at. Uh, I think certainly, I mean, I know that uh, one of the research papers that I remember um, reading recently was called Achieving Elusive Teacher Change. And there's so much captured just within that title. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for us as educators um, to, to look at our practice and to really in fundamental ways shift what we do and why we do it. And there are good reasons for that because a lot of the things that we're doing come from wisdom, they come from established research and evidence, and that's great. But at the same time, the world is changing underneath our feet. I mean, I teach mathematics. Mathematics is a timeless subject. It's one of the things to love about it. You know, once, once something is proven true mathematically, it is true forever. And that's why some of the, the oldest names that we will study, that anyone studies in school, Pythagoras, Euclid, they're, they're centuries old, but Pythagoras' theorem is still just as true today and it will be in, you know, millennia's time. Uh, for me, being able to say a timeless subject like that still needs to actually adapt and change because the way that mathematics is used day to day, it's different all the time. I mean, we've just been talking about COVID-19. Never before on such a daily basis have we been assaulted by numbers and charts and graphs and percentages. And for us to be able to navigate that world requires new skills. So I think COVID-19, even though we have paid a huge price for it, it has been a wonderful time to say, okay, well, I mean, I think about this, I mean, you and I are parents, and uh, one of the wonderful things about, uh, you know, having little children is that they teach you this one profound lesson, which is that it's amazing what a human being is capable of when you have no choice. And you know, our kids, they have the wonderful spiritual gift of having zero regard for our needs as a human being, and then suddenly things we thought were impossible, we find ways to do them. And I think that's this, this pandemic has given us so many experiences of that. So many times when we would have said, that's too hard, we can't do that, we can't rewrite that, we can't change the way we do that, but suddenly we've had no choice. So I really hope as we you know, progress, as you said, we're not at the end of this yet, but as we work out whatever new normal looks like, um, I hope it takes a lot of the lessons that we have learned um, and, and incorporates them into, yeah, a new business as usual, which is helpful to people and, and more accessible in ways that it wasn't before. Yeah, that's really wonderful, Eddie. And um, I, I, think that's, I think that's so important. I mean, I have been so um, inspired, not surprised, inspired by the amazing work that um, teachers are doing at the moment. And just to see how quickly um, teachers were able to switch online and be able to offer these blended uh, types of learning, I think are so wonderful. And I, I hope that we don't go back to how things were because it's just so exciting to see the direction that, and the trends uh, in which education is, is um, setting. So it's, it's really lovely to see. I know um, uh, YouTube is kind of like the university now. I mean, I, if you want to learn to play an instrument, if you want to learn how to code, if you want to learn how to YouTube, there's a, there's a YouTube channel for that. And so it's such a wonderful platform, I think, to get to have that accessibility into people's lives, in your mm. case, all over the world, which is um, an incredible privilege. Um, Eddie, just a couple of closing questions. Um, what advice would you give uh, to new teachers? So I'm thinking predominantly um, uh, primary school teachers because they all teach mathematics, mm. that may be a little bit uh, apprehensive, a little bit scared to teach maths. What advice would you give to these people? Yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind, and it comes directly out of my journey, but I think it's, I hope it's valuable to people, is that when I first started teaching, um, I thought that what it meant to be a, a really great teacher of mathematics, um, and as you point out, even if people may not identify as mathematics teachers, so many of us are teachers of mathematics, it's what we help our children to, to grab a hold of. What I thought it meant to be a good teacher of mathematics was to really know all the answers. And to be able to like, you know, like, oh, I know that question and just like straight away, just give the, the, the explanation and be really clear. And of course, like being able to get to an answer and have it be accurate and to explain that clearly, vital, of course, we're not questioning that. 
But the longer I've been a teacher, the, long, the more I've realized, in fact, a really effective teacher is not someone who knows all the answers, but who knows which questions to ask. And in fact, um, someone, uh, someone once wrote, you know, mathematics, real mathematics, is not about how many answers we know, it's about how we behave when we don't have the answers. What's the problem solving strategy I then adopt when there isn't just a, here's the five step algorithm for it. And the algorithm is part of mathematics, but the bigger part is the unknown. When you're in a novel situation, you're like, how am I gonna tackle this? What strategies do I have access to? So I guess the takeaway from all of that is, to be unafraid of being a co-learner with our students. Um, for me, knowing, like I, I have never found a class that I have been able to fool successfully um, as if I'm like, I know all the answers, I know everything, and then it takes like, what, five minutes for them to ask a question that I'm like, I, I need to look that one up, right? Why not have an attitude of, of co-discovery with our, our, our students and being able to say, okay, let's, let's work this one out together. Um, Anyone can do that. And I think that's a really important thing to take a hold of. That's where confidence comes from, not just from our own, how much knowledge we have stacked up there. Eddie, uh, just in closing, uh, two final questions. Um, what do you want your legacy to be in mathematics? If I could say it in a sentence, I think, what I'm hoping is that mathematics is something which everyone realizes they have a place in. So many people, view mathematics as something which is closed off to them. Um, students, and then when we become adults, in fact, we were talking about my book before, you know, people say like, oh, you've got an audience, you've got to imagine who you're talking to as you write. My, my muse, as it were, was a mathematically disenfranchised adult, someone who's like, that, that was once upon a time and it's over for me now. And I wanted people like that, I wanted to open the door back up and say, hey, hey, come back in, like there's a place for you here and a place that will not just, you know, uh, be, uh, make you more capable, but will enrich you as a person. Like that's what this is for, right? So I think I would love for my legacy that, to be that people can, can take a hold of mathematics and love it. And that also the other piece of this is that I love being a teacher. As much as I love mathematics, I hope that comes through. If you tomorrow told me um, Eddie, you can't teach mathematics for whatever reason, it's illegal now, it's been written out of the curriculum, etc., etc. I mean, I'd shed a tear because it's pretty awesome, but would I find something else to teach? Absolutely, because the kids are what it's about. And I'm, I'm so delighted I've had the opportunity to encourage and inspire educators all around, or people even to become educators. Um, our, our society, our country desperately needs more people to become teachers and to stay teachers. So if my legacy can be people who've been brought into that fold and people who remain and, and, and have a long lasting, persistent love for students and for their, what they teach, then I will be over the moon. Finally, Eddie, where can people find out more about you? I guess, you know, if you, <laughs> embarrassingly, if you Google my name, um, you will find, um, there's, there's another Eddie Wu who's a DJ in the United States. Um, but, but, but sadly for him, I feel terrible for him. Um, I, I think most of his Twitter mentions have been totally dominated by people who are talking about maths teaching, thinking that he's me. So I'm, a, I'm so sorry, Eddie Wu in San Francisco. Um, they can find me there. I'm on, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, um, all those kinds of things. And I love to hear from people, especially anyone who's been using my resources and has, has found it valuable in some particular way, that's always delightful to see. Amazing. Well, Eddie, I can't thank you enough uh, for taking the time. I, um, as, I, um, as I reflect on your work, it, it, it's just so inspiring and, and I'm so grateful for the generation of teachers that you are raising that will fall in love again with mathematics. I'm also so grateful for the generation of students that won't have that maths anxiety or that perception that maths is not for them that that many of us share and so from the bottom of my heart eddie thank you for everything that you are doing and it's an incredible privilege to get to speak to you so uh, I, I can't wait to see more of the amazing work that you do so thank you matt the pleasure's all mine